Oh yeah, I'm looking at box office numbers so we can talk about some of these. Nice. It's going to be very interesting. Informed info. I don't even know the box office info. Uh, oh, uh, we're not at a billion yet, but we're close. You might want to move that computer. No. Kind of like actually, there is, there is some doubt. <laughs> there is some doubt if uh, DOS will actually make a billion worldwide. Oh, it'll hit a billion. All right. See. You ready, Cliff? Well, I'm quite ready, as I said before. All right. <laughs> Wait, hold on. <laughs> He's going to ask me four more times if I'm ready. Yeah, everybody can hear you. They just can't see Can you. they hear us? Hello. Yeah. It's like having a conversation with my mom, which this audience is quite familiar with. <laughs> my mom was the special guest on our webcast last week. What? Last week? Yeah, it was fabulous. My That's awesome. My mom was visiting me, and so we had a special show about child literacy and what it's like raising children to really love books and, and how she grew up loving books. And so we had a really great talk about um, one of the more important things that Torn has supported over its many years. Uh, literacy and uh, getting children into reading really good books and it actually started with Tolkien with me and so mom talked about some of her childhood favorites when she was a little Aww. girl and uh, it was great so uh, we had a really great show and lots of great feedback from everyone I'll never have my mom on the show it was like Mr. Rogers right there <laughs> 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 yes Except a lot less creepy and a lot more wholesome. <laughs> uh, yeah. You thought Mr. Rogers was creepy? <laughs> the puppet parts were were a little. Those were my favorite. Oh my god, they, they were awful, awesome, but they like... were legitimately like intentionally creepy. I'm pretty sure, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, they had like weird stuff going on in Puppet Land. I think Lady Elaine was the very first lesbian I ever saw on broadcast television. <laughs> don't ruin my, don't ruin my memory of <laughs> I Mr. Think she, Rogers. I think that uh, you know Ellen DeGeneres must have so seen Lady Elaine when she was just a little girl and said, "I want to grow up and be just like." Just like Lady <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hola. It's Torn Tuesday, and we're back at Meltdown Comics uh, at uh, above the Nerdist uh, Theater. You know, they do a lot of Nerdist things here. Nerdist. Nerdist. Yeah. And this is, uh, this is Torn, is short for the One Ring dot net, and this is our first uh, broadcast into the new year of 2014. Um. And Quite incorrect. From, from this the is studio. Really our <laughs> third. From the studio. Uh, oh, from the studio. It's our first studio broadcast. Yeah, it's our first studio broadcast. Our, our previous 2014 broadcasts We've actually came from the, from the world headquarters of New Artist Expo, which is a fascinating place, and that was a really great place, but now we're back in Meltdown Comics. Here we are. And we are live with Noelle. She was here before. And Hello. She, ha she hadn't seen the movie yet. And now she's seen the movie. Now I've seen the movie. And she has uh, an opinion of Opinions. It. <laughs> Lots of opinions. <laughs> and <laughs> but, but before we dive <laughs> into, because I've seen it six times now and I love it wow. more and more every time. I've seen it in every version of the thing. But uh, we are now streaming on Justin.tv because uh, I like the name better. So uh, if you're just joining us, uh, this is a new chat room on the side of the wondering.net slash live. And uh, we're using Justin.tv. So if you want to create an account on Justin.tv, I can upgrade a couple of you to moderators, and, uh, and and it'll be fun. And I think we might be on the front page of Justin TV, so there might be like twenty, thirty thousand people watching. Whoa! Um, I, I don't know if uh, that's absolutely wonderful. Welcome, <laughs> yeah. welcome to the whole tangen tangential audience on Justin TV. Welcome to our little home on the web. This is the One Ring.net, which is forged by the fans for the fans of J.R.R. Tolkien. It's your one-stop shop for everything related to Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, news, rumors, and background uh, sound effects. We have a Foley artist downstairs and he's very busy making a little additional noises for I us. Wish I, had, I wish I had a soundboard right here. This yeah, you should. It makes it more dramatic. It's like we're, uh, you know, listening so, to some dwarves forging yeah, <laughs> yeah, armor. Sure. sure. I, I, <laughs> I always wanted to have a secret button somewhere that would go, science! <laughs> Just like that. Science? From, from the Thomas Dolby song. I don't often A joke that. often repeated by Professor Farnsworth. Before my time. On Futurama. B before my time. Well, you, can, you can text us at the really. Torn Hotline, 530-64-FRODO. <laughs> 530-64-FRODO. For can, Frodo. For fr <laughs> you can uh, text us on the Torn Hotline. Let me turn on our Skype, and uh, we'll take some calls at the end of the show. Because Skype is awesome. Acknowledgement to Hobbit fam. We just got our first text message on the hotline. Hello. Hello, everybody. And we have so many excited fans here in the chat room All with the us. normals are here. So, you know, the Golden Globes were this weekend. And you know what wasn't nominated? 
Hobbit Desolation of Smaug. For anything. At Not least it. the Hobbit first movie was nominated what for... What was it nominated for? Um, song? No. No? It wasn't song. nominated for anything? No. Golden Globe nominations didn't really strike. Oh, it's just acting and directing, huh? They didn't do anything for Um, it. Actually, I thought that the Ed Sheeran song was going to get a nom for a best song. Um, I've been listening to it over and over again. It's really, really good song. Do you know what my mom told me? It was quite surprising. My stepfather, sitting next to her in the theater, tears down his calloused, cold face <laughs> with the Ed Sheeran song. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. I, no, first of all, my stepdad doesn't even, you know, do that at movies, but that song at the end of the film may, makes people weep. And I, I'm waiting for Oscar nominations. I think that comes out day after tomorrow. Is that correct? I think... Th I don't know. I don't know when they come out. I'm pretty sure that Thursday the 16th will be the morning of Oscar nominees being announced. I will research that online while you guys continue. Do you think it'll be nominated for anything? See, now I feel bad because I, I don't do. remember the song at all. Oh, yeah. Like See, the song it, from the first like movie, which I really liked. I, do, I can't picture it in my head at all. It was just kind of like, oh, okay. But, I mean... <laughs> I, I might I have I still just been yelling, like, what the hell just happened at this, at this mod? Yeah. Everyone's so, so in shock when that song starts. Like, they're not listening <laughs> to anything yeah. except, yeah, agree. what? It's hard to listen to. Oh, there's a guy, my when second viewing, there's a guy sitting right behind me who, uh, as, soon as, it, as soon as it cut off at the end, he didn't know that it wasn't the end of the, of the series. He didn't know that there were three <laughs> movies. So he starts screaming. He's like, what the hell was that? You mean I have to sit through another movie? <laughs> he was so angry. <laughs> I felt really bad for him, actually. <laughs> I've, I've heard a couple of those responses repeatedly. <laughs> I've heard a, what the? But then someone actually stops themselves because the rest of the theater is a silence. And, and I've heard people exclaim similarly, <laughs> what the? <laughs> uh, <laughs> frustration. And, you, you know, my, my initial reaction when I first saw it was the same thing. I was really aggravated that they didn't deal with Smaug by the end of the film. I thought that the narrative of the whole story deserved that kind of closure. Well, I was just I mad that we had terrible, like we had like 20 minutes of this of this sequence that it had like no payoff and then it Bingo. was it was just like it was just killing time. <laughs> it was just adding the time there because they could and it wasn't even like, you know, it wasn't uh, like you, you it wasn't know, animated that well. I'm not animated. It wasn't like the, the effects weren't that good. What? Just, Oh, I thought the effects that's not, were pretty that's good. Not, that molten gold, it looked like nacho okay, cheese. Okay, yes. Yeah, the, the and that was like, that was the payoff. Like a, this golden dragon, then <laughs> he's just like, twirl. Well, my big, my big issue was that uh, we're two movies in now, and nobody's dead. No bad yeah, guys or no good this guys. This is true, this is true. Like, by this time in the two towers, we had known death. Mm -hmm. uh, multiple times over from on both sides on on the good guy and the bad guy side. Right. Um, and now it, it, it just feels like a cartoon. Like but Justin, I feel like you've yes. seen it six times. I've seen it only thrice, and you've seen it and you love it. And you say you love it more and more and more. It gets better it. with every viewing. It does. Yes. Then you don't mind the fact of this cliffhanger ending. We mind the cliffhanger ending. I didn't read the book, so I'm happy. Like I it, look, I watched. Catching Fire right before I saw Hobbit. There, there's another cliffhanger and ending. Cl catching Fire like punched me in the gut. I'm like, what? You can't end here. Like, I want to go to District 913, whatever it is. Like, <laughs> see, see I, I didn't mind the cliffhanger ending. That's the thing. I, I didn't mind, but I thought that it should have just been Bilbo, you know, I don't think the dwarf should have gone into the mountain at all. I think it just should have been like Bilbo, like, you know, messes with the dragon, tries to get the Arkenstone, then the dragon is like, well, now you made me mad, I'm going to go kill those people. You can still have your, like, oh crap moment when, like, Smog is flying away. Uh, you know, you've, you've gotten all the cool parts of Smog, and it's just like that whole sequence, it just makes him seem, like, incompetent, because he's like, it's like, the reason the dwarves couldn't go in is because he would smell them, and then there's that part where he, like, walks directly over them, and does not realize they are there. Yeah, and I'm just I didn't like, buy that There's, for a like, second. 13 dwarves, not 13, 13, like, just Nine. shy of 13. Nine. Yeah, there's yeah. a few <laughs> of them not even And there. they are, like, a few uh, feet below uh, him, and he does not realize that they are there, and I'm uh, like, there's no th nothing over them, I'm just like, what's wrong with this dragon, man? I thought it was awesome. I thought he was like really good at being a dragon. And I thought, uh, well, and I thought it was weird. Like, oh, you carry something precious. Like the dragon knew what was up. He's yeah. like, oh, I know, I know about what's going on in Middle Earth. I know what the, you know. I know more than you think. So I it, like the <laughs> just, this dragon just became uh, like this all-knowing. Like he must have one of those uh, uh, things, those uh, the, orbs, uh, uh, or think. Yeah. Yeah. What do they, what do they call those cliff? 
Uh, what, on the Palantir? Palantir, yeah. there we go. Well, it totally. is... It There's is, a Palantir in that pile of gold. There Probably. There is constant, constant uh, comment, and I'm not talking about the Bigelow tea bags. There's constant comment about how did the Dragon Smaug know of the new nickname that Thorin had earned in between the 171 years that expired between the sacking of Erebor when Smaug originally shows up and the moment we are in in the narrative of Desolation of Smaug. So where is he getting his news? And his reviews? Maybe he's the getting, bird is bringing him newspapers every he's, day. He's got, notifi- yeah. he's got push notifications yeah. from Huffington Post. He's on Twitter. And Smaug <laughs> is getting the little bits <laughs> on his device. His, I don't know. Let but. me ask you this. If he's if he's covered in gold, doesn't that make, make it harder to pierce him now? Like, they've just doubled up on his golden scales. Yeah, that was the idea. Like, like he had so many jewels and gold in his stomach. Like, uh, in the book, he had, like, a soft belly. Yes. It, he didn't have scales there, so he lay on all the gold, and it pressed into his skin, and he had, like, this <gasps> entire, like, shield of golden jewels on his stomach. And there was one spot where he didn't have them. That's so right. that was, like, that was the plot point. And on this one, he had scales, but he also had gold. And mm-hmm. then, like, And now uh, he has liquid missing. gold on top of the scales. Except he twirled it away. He did, a, he did a twirl in the sky, and now the gold is gone. So, you yeah. know. Yeah. That literally didn't affect anything in the long run. We just watched, like, <laughs> dwarves tumbling for, for half an hour and with no payoff. So, yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little mad about that. It's very... No, I'll, 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 I will... I will have to play devil's advocate for just a second okay. because you've got passive characters or assertive characters in a story, in a film like this, and the screenwriters are probably thinking which type of characters are more interesting to watch. If Thorin and company were going to sit outside the mountain passively and do absolutely nothing, then, which is what happens in the real book, but, but, but if that's the case, and he's trying to fill this movie with you know, extravagant visual set pieces and trying to show that Thorin is much more motivated as a leader than, than even Tolkien lets on, then, you know, he, the, the writers decided, let's construct this whole thing where we're going to have a different level of engagement with the dwarves not staying passive, but actually coming inside the mountain. And yet, as, as ambitious as that was, as, a, as an idea in the story, it does have creaky problems by the very fact that Smaug should be able to smell them. He walked right over that little pathway and we saw his body and his tail go over them and they're like, oh look he doesn't see us, let's keep going. So there, there is that. You know, I, there is that issue. I get well. that, and I but think that they could have done something like that. But I think that the way they did it was actually did the opposite, where like mm-hmm. Thorin just comes off really badly in this movie. Like mm-hmm. Thorin, yes, yes, like him, like threatening Bilbo, um, refusing to let him leave, making everyone go inside in the first place, and then getting them trapped. It was like it was all kind of his shoddy decisions that led them there. And you even have Bard saying like, "Don't do this. You're gonna." anger the dragon and destroy our town put us all in danger so all of these decisions like and and they don't even really establish that like you know well i mean they kind of do i guess they do say like thor like the reason that thorn is like acting like this is because he's um he like is under this sickness or this curse or something in the arkenstone i guess which would, doesn't make that much sense but like so but I just don't think we know Thorin well enough when he's like actually being a good leader to like give him the benefit of a doubt for that, you know, and be like. Yeah. Well, I, here I, hmm. I'm, I'm coming at it just from a regular movie going perspective. Like I don't know his ultimate fate yet. All I saw was that you slow, slow saw him slowly go more insane, and he gets called out. Like this isn't the Thorin I know. Like the Santa yeah. Claus dude was like, this isn't the Thorin I know. He wouldn't have done that. What are you doing? Like, you slowly saw him go a little more insane, a little more crazy, to the point where he's, like, riding a a freaking wheelbarrow down a river of gold. Like, he is way insane to get get this gold. Like, uh, 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 Flintheart Glomgold is, is, like, the level of insanity. Like, all he wants is the gold. (laughs) Flintheart who? You know, uh, Uncle Scrooge's arch nemesis. I did oh, not know that. Okay, you mean no, Uncle Scrooge like... McDuck. Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> Uncle Scrooge McDuck's arch nemesis. I was like, which nemesis. dwarf was this now? <laughs> oh my gosh, that was brilliant. That was a <laughs> reach, I'm but it was brilliant. Well, yeah, uh, was... but uh, uh, I just saw <laughs> that you, you it, they, they make, uh, uh, there were a couple points in the movie where they actually take the time to say, this isn't the thorn I'm familiar with. Like, you're going crazy, man. Like, what are you doing? So, I think it wor- I, it works from a movie perspective. I think I I, I kind of appreciate having um, his name is Ballin. Thanks for the text. 
Yeah. <laughs> Santa Claus dwarf. I knew who you meant. So. Uh, this Santa Claus dwarf. I've, I'm never going to forgive you for that. <laughs> Justin, but I've heard, I've heard other people say that too. That's very funny. <laughs> there, is, there is nothing in this movie narrative about Smaug having extra protection on his soft undersides. There's, and we know in this day and age that's dangerous. There's <laughs> other there's other ex, you know exposition about Girion, Lord of Dale, who we're told very explicitly is Bard's ancestor, and how he succeeded in taking a really good nick out of the side of the dragon, and there was some kind of a wound or an opening, and if he had only made that one more shot, he would have killed the dragon, blah, blah, blah. And and that's what they talk about, and um, that's the direction we're supposed to go. This ex this now excludes the need for a talking thrush. This, ex you know, no longer Because the birds requires don't talk. We need, we already The spiders do. That. The spiders do. Well, they only talk in the dark now, world. Now Bilbo does not have Actually, to have a conversation with the thrush and what tell the thrush to they send the information once he comes back out. to Bard. About that, Bilbo hears them because now he takes he, the he ring off and they keep talking. Oh, yeah. Watch, yeah, you've seen it six times. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was really cool. I thought that was a really cool way to it, do that. That's like the influence of the uh, of the ring, like slowly. Maybe they yeah, maybe drift, it's still on off. him somehow. But yeah. it, they definitely keep talking once he's because back in he, the physical. He, like, oh, and it says it stings, and the spider says it stings, and yeah, they Bilbo keep talking. Can hear it. Yeah. Okay, another gaff. All right, that's interesting. I didn't even notice that myself. Wait, did, did, did does the dragon talk to Thorn? Mm, yes, yeah. Dra the, the dragon gets uh, re it receives a lot of insults from Thorin. Yes, yeah, Thorin but, but calls him a slug, etc., etc. Yeah, there's but direct to Bil dialogue. Bilbo hears everything. Like we, the only time we see the dragon talk is when Bilbo's in the room. No, the dragon. No, he talks to the dragon. The, dwarves. the dragon speaks. The dragon um, speaks to everybody. I believe I'll have to watch. Um, well, I'm going to go see it for a fourth time uh, tomorrow morning at the matinee. Um, but I, I'm pretty curious about. Some of the ins and outs of this this internal logic of, of how Bilbo can understand, but the language barrier is not you know beholden to the ring. The dragon always spoke, and it has nothing to do with the ring. Yeah. But, but that's that's very interesting. Uh, you heard that spiders still talking. After yeah, you definitely. The ring. So you definitely I just took that. I just took that as like because at first I was like, oh, he can only hear them when he has the ring on, and I thought that was actually really cool. Uh -huh. And then as soon as he took the ring off and he continued to hear them talking, I was like, oh, that's just not true. What I thought just a second ago, like they really are talking, and the dwarves, I don't could probably hear them were they not unconscious and in webs at that time. You know, the the funny thing is about uh, hearing everything because you put the ring on. Um, yeah. Making movies is always a collaborative process. I mean, there's hundreds mm -hmm. of people and hundreds of artists, you know, and sculptors. And, you know, everybody at the beginning of any project, whether it's a TV show or a movie, like everybody gets together like, okay, what should we do? And where should we take this? But, you know, so no one can actually really take credit for one specific thing. But we know that our friend uh, Johnny, who uh, is one of the illustrators, he came up with the, the, the design of Radagast. You know, he he he's, so he's he responsible was, for the bird shit. Yeah, he was saying that you know uh, on the first day of pre-production when Guillermo del Toro was in the room, Peter Jackson was there. The first day, Johnny raised his hand at the back of the room and says, "You know, wouldn't it be cool if Bilbo only heard the things when the ring was on?" So, like, you know, wh whether or not the the Peter Jackson was already thinking about that, uh, you know, it, 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 he takes quite pride. You know, a lowly artist in the middle of this huge production you know he, he's quite he's quite proud of you know being able to say you know i brought that up in a meeting that's a big <laughs> story element and he should be totally getting credit for that um here's here's something uh, that's quite interesting um we're looking at a total of 42 uh, days of release where the desolation of smog has been in domestic release in the united states uh just about four and a half weeks now and has made just just shy of 243 million so far and its worldwide box office is now 808 million worldwide 808 808 state A heartbreak i love 808 state and now uh there's some co there's some talk and some contention amongst the box office prognosticators trying to find and you say that five times fast i dare you with a mouthful <laughs> of marbles i dare you oh my goodness. there's some discussion about whether this is the first Middle Earth film that will not break the one billion dollar mark. It will for sure break a billion. You think so? Oh yeah. 
because people like you go and see it six times. Well, they're, <laughs> they're waiting for the Academy Award nominations to come out, and then they, if they gets nominated, boom, boom, boom. Well, unfor- guaranteed. Unfor- Gravity unfor- comes out again this year, mm. this week. Gravity a re-release? Yeah, they're re-releasing Gravity mm. because very big surprise that Gravity did not win Best Picture Drama at the Golden Globes. Big, big surprise. I'm not going to disparage 12 Years a Slave because I haven't seen it, but I could have sworn on my bottom dollar that Gravity was going to be the Best Picture. Um, I'm yeah. really, really surprised about that. We're getting a lot of comments in the chat room that uh, there's some technical issues. We're checking, well, all, all of our folks uh, at uh, uh, off-site and on-site can see the chat and stream pretty good uh so i don't know if it's just a connection quality and again growing pains we're, we're kind of making this up as we go along so no here's, uh, here's a fun thing it it so happens that gravity does have something in common with desolation of smaug it stayed number one at the box office three weekends in a row no other films none that were released in the year 2013, were able to stay in the top spot weekend after weekend after weekend, three weekends in a row. Only Gravity and only The Hobbit, DOS, could stay at the number one spot. Do you think the Ho- it would be appropriate for The Hobbit to stay in theaters the rest of the year? Like, just put put it one screening a day on a small <laughs> screen in the back. Like, just leave it out there. Because wh- I, I want to go see it on the big screen, like with the dragon and everything. Sure. Just, just have it there. Sure. I had this conversation with one of my friends just earlier today. He said, you know, it's not that important for me to go and see it on the big screen. He's like, I can just see it later on home video. And I Mm. said to him, "Ah, Mm, if you want to see a big, fully realized dragon, you've got to do the theatrical experience. You've got to. What? The the whole HFR, like, it was ridiculous compared to, because I only saw it when I was at home, did not see it in theaters, and then I saw the second one in the theaters. It, it's worth it. Well, that's why they keep like re-releasing them in theaters every once in a while because they really are best when they are at that size, at that scale. So mm-hmm. you know, I could, I, I, I'm, um, whatever on the HFR or whatever. You know, I just want it on the big screen. Now, The Hobbit: Desolation was the second movie of the year that had big, big creatures. What did you? How do you? What do you think of the comparison of Pacific Rim versus the Dragon? Like, who did it better? Who did who did the creatures better? Hmm. I mean, I really <laughs> liked Pacific Rim. So I, nice. I really like. I really like Pacific Rim. Um, We're fans. I, I I don't know if I can say which one was like constructed, which one was actually done better in terms of special effects, but. I think the dragon gets uh, dropped several points just because of that. God. Like the the gold, the molten gold. Really, I could that not one scene. Well, that's, a, that's a story complaint. I was that's a story complaint, not a complaint about the realization yeah, of the dragon. Yeah, it's true. But it's true. It's that's it's a, it's, it's, it's still complaint. affects the realization of the dragon because when he's like crawling in it, it just it, it, it goes from real yeah. to oh, this is fake. Like all it takes is one little thing to take you completely out of the realism, you and think? that gold takes you out of the realism. You think so? For sure. Hmm. When that statue just like bubbles and like oozes and, and then it goes ah, <laughs> yeah. Plorsh, yeah. It goes it's uh, yeah. Did that was the word balloon that I was going to draw plorsh. over the screen. Plorsh. That was <laughs> Did you see the, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I forget who the illustrator was, but someone, someone drew a, a little webcomic saying if, if Guillermo del Toro had stayed on the movie, it would have turned into a robot instead of melting. Well, no, like, it, <laughs> and then we would have had a robot dwarf <laughs> <laughs> that would actually be great, and I would love that. So I know, like uh, a mechanical to master this, and then the you know the dragon starts like starts spewing acid or something. Um, okay, I what I really did like about the dragon was how like the fire breathing effect. Yeah, I'm really a sucker for the like magma cracks like all in his scales when he does that. That was really cool. That was Otherwise, cool. I thought he was just kind of standard dragon, and I really liked how the how the kaiju in Pacific Rim had all of those like glowing bits on them. Yeah. I thought that that made them like different and interesting. So. Mm. I, I, I mean, we have to. People say it's unfair to compare with the Lord of the Rings trilogy, but we have to. The Balrog, I feel, was better executed than the dragon. Well, I think because they just didn't have like he had to stay obscured to some extent. But it, it and had it's those always things. Better when you can't see it so clearly because your imagination fills in and it's it remembers it being way better than it was because you can't you don't ever really get a good look at the Balrog. 
even when you do, he's like he's you get literally a made frame, of shadow. But you get a like, full frame head when he first screams at Gandalf. Like yeah, he, he is really he is full frame. But it's more like the 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 Pacific Rim stuff. Uh, you know, because all of his veins glow. Like, every time he gets, the Balrog gets mad, it's like... Whoa. Yeah, and I feel like the Balrog almost isn't quite solid in the way that Smaug is, because he is made of flame so much. He is, like, he clearly does have weight and stuff, but, um... He, I think you can get away more. That's, like, one of the big things with CGI with me is that it, they don't seem like they're physically <sighs> present in that world. But, like, when it's fire, you can get away with more of that because it's, uh, it's not really, like, a physical... Well, it's physical, but it's not, like, a... Well, I mean, here, here's the thing. Again, I, uh, like, I read the Silmarillion. If I recall correctly, uh, sm dragons like Smaug were, like, uh, beasts to, the, um, to Balrogs. Like, Balrogs tamed dragons. So, like, if we're supposed to think that the dragon is, that uh, Smaug is, like, the great evil, and, like, we, like he's, the great evil, I don't know, there, there's a different level of evil in the Hobbit trilogy. Because, like, we know, uh, if you read the, 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 like, the dragon isn't as powerful as the Balrog. What do we call, we're getting a call. Are we? There's, there's an interesting conversation with that orc that is interrogated by Thranduil and Legolas. Uh, Tariel is very quickly asked to leave, and in a huff, she walks right out and leaves. And the creature with the knife blade at his neck says, My master serves the one, referring to Balg serving the one. Balg. Which is an, out, yeah, an outside reference to Sauron. And then the, the orc says something... Uh, blah, 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 fire's upon you, you have no idea, uh, war is upon you. And then he gets beheaded, and th and I think it's either Thranduil or, or, or the orc right before he dies, who says, um, thank you, that's my bag, do you need something out of my bag? That's not what he says. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That line is not in the you're, movie. You're welcome to it, but, <laughs> but some of the garish surprises that you might find inside might well, be I, I, a bit much for your virgin eyeballs. We're looking for Francisco's backpack, sorry. Heavens to America. I don't see a backpack. It's right here. There's no backpack over here. But anyways, here's, here's the fun thing. He says that the Master is about to release a weapon. I don't know if that weapon that is referred to in that interrogation scene is a reference to the One Ring. Because Sauron is, where Sauron is sensing it about, or is it a direct reference to Smaug? Because or if he has another weapon. Yeah, but uh, that was always Gandalf's, always Gandalf's main fear that Sauron would use the dragon as a weapon. And so, do you think that's ultimate payoff in this trilogy? Is that he is a serpent of evil? Okay, because we know that that Sauron is already hooked up with uh, uh, the Great Goblin. Uh, so Sauron already has his has his you yeah, know, fingers in all of the problem. creatures mm -hmm. of Middle Earth. Like this isn't mm -hmm. uh, like he's already in mm -hmm. because the Great Goblin in the Extended Edition was like I'm gonna call that that White Orc because he was here first and like we got you, you know. Oh, that's in the theatrical edition too. He says send a message to the Pale Orc that we have Thorin. Yeah. So yeah, the the Pale Orc Azog. <laughs> who is quite suddenly and abruptly replaced by Balg in the film. You're not complaining. Ah, uh, I know. <laughs> but, but we replaced one CG white yeah. orc with another CG white orc. Balg is slightly orc. better somehow for this me. Balg this Balg would have been awesome. better. This looks awesome. Like, they should have just kept it as this Balg. Conan, Conan Stevens. See, he has, was, like, yeah, blonde stuff. hair and, like, a red beard that looks like he taped it on, which I really like. He's got bear claws for, like, shoulder pads. He's got a spine over his spine <laughs> and, like, femurs strapped to his ankles. That's this is an cool. awesome orc design. Yeah. And, and it was real. It was practical. See, it was what the... Why would they do that to me? Like, Lurt uh. is infinitely more scary than anything I've seen in the Hobbit. Because he's real. He's there. He's, like, hitting the... I'm, ugh. You know what? I hey. Azog I, is the worst for me. He's just so smooth and white and video gamey looking. And, World of and looking. yes, I just mm. want to. I kind of I kind of dig the designs of all the goblins and the orcs, but uh, there are many fans and even some mainstream reviewers in the press who have complained about the presence of orcs when there are none in the original book. But mm. here's here's the thing. It's got um, quite a package going on there. I know, yeah. like, and that's the toy. I know. Oh my. Oh, oh, there's 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 something interesting going on here where um, uh, Balg all of a sudden appears as a replacement for Azog, and I was I was hoping that we would hear some more common tongue, some more regular 
speech. I don't know why all the orcs are all subtitled. None of the orcs in Lord of the Rings trilogy have any subtitles at all. Because they were orcs they of Sauron. They all speak the common tongue. Because even the Mordor orcs, they go, Don't you know we're at war? <laughs> you know? And you hear that in the extended Got edition. Shiny, like, sharp touch mine. Yeah. yeah, and how about when poor Frodo is attacked by Shelob, and he's all wrapped up and oh, assumed yeah. assumed to be dead. The orcs from Kirith Ungol, they speak in the common tongue, and they actually say... She likes them that way. <laughs> she sticks them in and eats yeah. them while they're fresh. You're right. And, and, and I love listening to orcs talk in a ridiculous Cockney accent that is way overboard. I'm not Why that interested in orcs well, speaking maybe. in black speech. It's not as interesting. I maybe because the orcs have know. kind of been like underground or like wild this whole time they haven't had like a <laughs> ruling force until sauron reappears oh, so they just been kind of feral you know they've just been hanging out okay. with each other yeah. and then as soon as sauron's in charge he's like i don't know speak english or something i have no That's idea that doesn't idea. really make a lot of sense because sauron doesn't actually speak english or Not whatever what common the tongue what do you call it the common speech the common, common speech, tongue yeah, yeah, yeah. all right yeah. If, if if sauron Fast already ha has the the goblin and if sauron already has the dragon do you think sauron already has saruman we're gonna learn that in the third film we're, you know what we see in the first film i think is is Saruman trying to um sway the white council to not even be interested and not even look around what's going on with uh, the necromancer because at that point in time Tolkien states that Saruman wants to continue searching through the 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 veil of the river Anduin Saruman is currently looking for <laughs> the ring at that point in time we got a text message saying what about them they're fresh <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know who that was that. I think that was, that was it was Andy Serkis was doing all the voices for that was he yeah uh, some were Craig but Parker Oh really? Yeah, I thought and was, Jed Brophy. Andy, yeah, Jed Brophy did some. The starfish dwarf. I think mm -hmm. that maybe they were doing. They were like physically, but he did the voices. He did the for that voices. Whole scene. <laughs> I do this thing sometimes. Wherever I'm like, if I ever say like I'm starving for any reason, then I'll like segue into like we ain't had mag nothing but magby bread for three stinking days. I which depending on whether the person I'm talking to is actually like a fan of Lord of the Rings or not, either yes. leads to like extreme confusion or actually that's that's more that's here's, common. Here's what I'm missing. This is. The, this is the part of me, the jokester, the jester <laughs> in me, the Loki, uh, half brother of, of uh, Thor. This is this is what bothers me. I love those goofy, quotable bits of what the orcs say. We have no quotable we have orc like nothing from the yeah. Hobbit film, except for some small English or common speech that we hear during the interrogation scene. You know, but it's really not as good as. Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys. You know, that's so great. Do you, do you think... <laughs> I miss that. I, I, I feel like I that, that there's there's the words are there on the page. Um, but I was kind of, you know, on my last couple of viewings, like, especially like Thorin saying, if we're all going to die, we're going to die by fire. You know, like, I, I feel like there's so many... You, everyone remembers Lord of the Rings. Like, there's every single movie of Lord of the Rings had so many quotable things. Mm -hmm. and, and then I come, come out of Desolation, and it's just there aren't a lot of quotes like you said i and I, I have a feeling that has to do maybe with the performance like i know it's sacrilegious to say oh the performances aren't good in the hobbit but they're just less they're cartoony they're not as dramatic because i, I don't feel like that line from freaking a lot of fans love that line but it doesn't hold it doesn't hold do you think that's deliberate do you guys think the writers are really trying to make the hobbit that much different from its predecessor trilogy that it has less of those earmarks. Uh, I know this is ridiculous to say because there's so many patterns and examples of exact things that, the, that they keep replicating from Lord of the Rings, but do you think that the dialogue and all that stuff was they were trying to make it like a little bit different, a little bit more like you know, the children's tale that, that suddenly grows up by the time it gets to the I end know, of the I know, tale? I think the, the, writer, the writers did a good job uh, creating consistent with Lord of the Rings, but I think it was the, the, the casting, uh, the performances that I'm seeing in The Hobbit, the first two Hobbit movies, yeah, they hired a bunch of comedians, you uh, know, where last time they hired a bunch of, like, thespians, mm -hmm. right? They're, like, this movie is stacked with comedians, and there and back again is going to be even more comedians. You know, you have Billy Connolly, the funniest guy out there, trying it's to be awesome. like the dwarf of all dwarves. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna. It's it. it there, there's just a the the timing, the dramatic timing of dramatic thespian actors in Lord of the Rings is so spot on. Like their in, intonations, their inflections, and then here you have a bunch of comedians that are always trying to crack each other up. 
Yes. And yeah, on well. the, I, that's what I, I feel that it's not on the page, it's on the performance. But maybe I'm like looking too much into it. You are. Across, you have to toss me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone. Uh, Nobody heard that. Nobody heard that. This is. I cannot make that distance. You'll have to toss me. <laughs> <laughs> that was good, Efren. That was very, very good. Uh, but no, all right. The, yeah, the Hobbit. Uh, both of the films seem to have a, a surfeit of uh, of quotable bits. I just miss that bad Cockney uh, orcs who are just so overboard with their goofy dialogue. I love that stuff. Goofy but, dialogue said dramatically. Like, you didn't laugh when they said them because of the way they said them. You, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, don't know if I, I don't know if I'm coming across how I need to. But, like, there's, there's a, a tonal difference in the delivery of a lot of these lines. Perhaps, yes. Yes. Even, even um, uh, Barry Humphreys, who's well known as the great... Uh, comedian. Comedian, drag queen. Again, uh, a comedian. Dane Edna. Even, even there in the extended edition um, of... Uh, an unexpected journey. I don't. I don't think that the Great Goblin um, had as much funny smackdown one-liners that I thought we were going to get from Barry Humphreys. Um, that's what I'm saying. The writers wrote a dramatic movie, and then they hired comedians to try to lighten the mood. Like so, the casting, okay. hmm. the casting, it doesn't quite line up with the writing. Hmm. Does that it, does that how hold any water? I'm making this up. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> right? I mean, it sounds what, right let, to uh, me. I mean, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of, like, any memorable lines at all in these movies. Exactly. And, like, you know, we've got Stephen Fry. We've even got... We've got some of the funniest people in <sighs> all of entertainment in this movie. From the dwarves on up to the master, to the great goblin, everything. And even, like, actually humorous characters, like the trolls from... I never you know, laughed the at the trolls. Move, they weren't funny. They weren't? And, uh, they were very infantile. They had a kind of infantile humor to them, but they weren't actually funny. I laughed more at Treebeard than I laughed at the trolls. Yeah. And Treebeard's not supposed to be funny. Well, but maybe they gave it's just some great jokes, you know. Maybe it's, it was just easier for them with with the Lord of the Rings because it is this very weighty thing that they were like, okay, we have to lighten the mood, and they were, you know, very deliberately put in, uh, you know, comic relief. And in this one, they are trying to prove to everyone that you know it can be as epic as, as Lord of the Rings uh, was. They're trying to prove that it is dramatic and uh, has that weight to it, which you know, in the book, is there's a lot more kind of goofy goofy stuff um, befitting a children's book. There's a, there's a mention in the chat room of someone who has said one of Balin's lines of dialogue, which I agree, my hat's off to Ken Stott. Ken Stott is a great, great actor who didn't go for comedy in any of his dwarven dialogue, but Balin does say, if in fact <laughs> you do find a sleeping dragon down there, don't weaken it. Oh yeah, that was funny. Yeah, you did. I like you that. Did, that some, was good. There are some little bits here and there, but I was thinking Stephen Fry was going to give us some great, memorable one-liners and and the delivery, the delivery of, of all of Ken Stott's lines are perfect, awesome. Yes. Yeah. You know, for everything from like you know something about hobbits, you know, a, a, all the way to to that line is like you know Thorin, you're you're not the guy we knew. It, like everything that that he says is is perfect that's what i'm saying i think it's the delivery and i don't know if that's the direction like with it, peter jackson directed this movie more like george lucas he sat back in a dark room with 3d glasses on and said ah you know i didn't like that 3d take let's do another 3d take he wasn't like you know if you watch all the behind the scenes things like peter jackson's always in the tent he's not like right there looking mm. looking at an actor's eye as the actor is saying it Whereas you watch the Lord of the Rings ex uh, uh, appendices, he's always he's watching the performance on stage, not on a 3D screen. Like he was more obsessed with like getting a good 3D performance and actually getting an acting performance. That's um, that's. You're not the first hmm. person 
to say that. I'm going to get a quote out of the Atlantic magazine. The Atlantic? The review, wow, man, this is good. A review by David Orr from the Atlantic. He actually says this is, this is one of the stronger criticisms against the desolation of Smaug, and it goes in alignment with what you were saying, but it also is different because David Orr did not enjoy desolation of Smaug, and you enjoy it more and more and more each time. But here, the reference to Lucas comes in right here. Bear with me. I've got to read this. Um, uh, the reviewer is talking about all of the substantive changes from the book to this new adaptation. And the writer says, Be forewarned, whether through ego or avarice or unchecked enthusiasm, Jackson has entered deep into the realm of fan fiction. Indeed, having granted himself boundless license to reimagine, he seems to have begun reimagining even his own reimaginings. <laughs> the hideous orc leader, who was relentlessly pursuing our heroes, Re whom Jackson introduced to us in the previous film, Azog, that. is Just in this is. movie yeah. replaced by a different hideous orc leader <laughs> pursuing our heroes. <laughs> At some point, this level of constant reinvention threatens to become not only self-reinforcing, but self-consuming. Where does Jackson go after he completes this expansive retelling of The Hobbit? Will he reissue the Lord of the Rings trilogy with new material added to reflect <laughs> the I canonical it, changes that he's <laughs> made here? Parenthesis, the real reason Legolas dislikes dwarves is... Dot, 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 close paren. Or here's the closing whammy. This is, this is for you, Justin. Will he adapt the Silmarillion, or what? Or will he retreat from view to tinker with his high frame rate toys? Whatever his decision, Jackson has by now laid to rest any lingering doubt that he is, indeed, the new George Lucas. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's what that's... David Orr said in The Atlantic. Now, what do you say, sir? What do you say? I say I've been saying that for a year and a half. I don't know. Special editions coming. You have been saying that for years. Well, so uh, so one of the things I wanted to ask: Does the uh, you've been a Hobbit fan uh, with the books and everything? Do, do the movies feel like they were written by women? Um, I don't know what that means. I mean, I, I mean <laughs> like, a lot of things are like uh, a lot of people are, are you know upset that Tariel exists. You know, it's like oh, we got to put a love story in of course you know a couple women wrote this movie but they wrote the lord of the rings too yeah that's what i was gonna but say but people were just as angry if you go back to the one ring archives and look at all the fan reviews for two towers oh man there was some hate going on like the the, mm -hmm. the 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 intended thought that arwen was going to fight at helm's deep and that the, they shot footage of arwen at helm's deep like people were pissed more pissed than i've ever uh, seen with toriel so do, do you think that uh, it's that unchecked thing? Like, you know, Peter and the writers in Lord of the Rings, like, took it to, we're starting to take it to that level, Arwen at Helm's, Helm's Deep, and then pulled back and said, you know what, let's, let's stay, stay true to the thing. But here, The Hobbit, it's like, let's just go for it. That's different. Yeah, here's an interspecies love affair that nobody interspecies. had ever that thought of. That's disgusting. It's true. It's true. When cats lie down with dogs, when Tariel flirts with Keeley, this is what's happening here. But it is... It is something that I think is symptomatic of having a strong female hand at the screenwriting table, where Peter was distracted, perhaps, with a lot of other stuff he had to do as a director. I think perhaps Philippa and Fran had the lion's share of doing uh, what, what was done in Desolation of Smaug and introducing uh, perhaps what many people think is a necessary female character when there are none in The Hobbit. Now, other fans I've spoken to, hardcore book fans, have said, why not just change the gender of one of the 13 dwarves and have one of them be female and have it even be talked about as an afterthought? But why can't you have both? Yeah, I guess. Why can't you have way more women? It's completely conceivable to me that several of those dwarves are female since we don't... I mean, they've, now they've added, like, the female dwarves who are beardless and you know, don't look very much like the male dwarves, which is not what, what we understand female dwarves to look like from Tolkien's writings and from what uh, Gimli says. They do and have the extended beards. They do have They, they have little whiskers, but, little I mean, the idea beards. was that people couldn't tell them apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, they they that's looked right. the same, and I always thought it was possible that the dwarves didn't really care because there wasn't a big difference for them either. Uh -huh. They were just like... You know, everyone's like, oh, well, where's your women? Who, who are the women? And they're like, we don't even know, like, it's just not a big thing for them, you know? They're like, well, some of us are women and some of us are men, but they didn't, maybe they don't have, like, a... Sorry, 
I'm going to give you some room so you don't bump your elbow here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they don't have a, like a really, really strong like concept of gender. So like I, I, ah. I wish I feel like that would be a more interesting and creative uh, thing for the writers to have pursued. Um, I liked Tariel. I, mm -hmm. I, I liked her addition. I liked the character. I thought the love triangle was uh, unnecessary, but it was really <laughs> only the addition of Legolas's reaction to it that made it a love triangle. Mm -hmm. I think that that could have easily been cut, although I gotta be honest, I laughed hysterically at all of his reaction shots to the whole thing. <laughs> when he's like, when he like narrows his eyes at Keeley in the jail cell, I like, I was losing it everywhere because it is so funny to me. I just... <laughs> Um, and then when it's like she's talking, I really like the scene where, where Tariel is talking to Keeley and they're just talking like yeah. humans, which is something we didn't get like a whole lot from, from the original trilogy. Like there was a lot, there wasn't just kind of casual uh, was flirtation between two characters talking about things that weren't, yeah, that weren't about like the fate of the world or whatever. So, um. It, it, I really liked that scene, and then <laughs> it pans up, and like this is like standing yeah. in the rafters, and I'm just like. <laughs> I kept expecting every scene after that to have like like when she's healing <laughs> Keely to have it like pan up and he's like he's holding onto hovering. the ceiling or yeah. something and he's just like <laughs> oh my god <gosh. laughs> you guys oh my god so Christ. completely unnecessary but really funny to me anyway um, I, I liked the idea of the romance if I didn't like the way that it was executed mm -hmm. I didn't like the kind of uh, heavy handedness of it, but I like the idea, I've always liked the idea of elves and dwarves getting together. Mm -hmm. um, I've always just kind of thought that they had definitely like a thing for each other. It would almost be like the Middle Earth equivalence of like homophobia, where like a lot of elves are like, I'm so into dwarves, but they can't say it. So they end up just like hating on the dwarves instead. Right, to I like get make that. every, like throw everyone off their ta tail. And so like Legolas is like, I hate dwarves, they're so ugly. <laughs> Ugh, I hate them. But he's really like, I have strange feelings about dwarves. <laughs> Well, that's just my Tariel wouldn't have had an interest in any of the of any of the other dwarves that had prosthetic makeup and big bulbous noses. We get Tariel attracted to the youngest dwarf, uh, not really uh, according to the internal logic of this movie. It's supposed to be Adam Brown's character Ori, but yes, Keeley, who has no fake ears and no fake nose and barely stubble. I think he has a little fake nose. Does he have Just a, a smaller one than really? everyone tiny else. Yeah, because yeah. really? Aiden Turner has like a, a narrow little nose. So really? I think. I think. Because I didn't. I, I could look it up. I thought that. Well, we do need to find out. And he has prosthetic ears, oh, yeah. sort of. Isn't he on like Arrow or something bit. like that, or something else? Yeah. He's been in stuff. He's like British, so he's been in like British stuff. I don't know what he's oh, okay. in. Well, I I would have enjoyed seeing. Yes, we got a text message saying the theme, the music theme for Tariel and Keeley was amazing. That's the best part of the whole soundtrack. Like. Yeah, yeah, it is beautiful. It, it's beautiful. the only thing I can remember out of the soundtrack. Yeah, mm -hmm. You know, like you said, I can't even remember the Ed Sheeran song. But I remember Tariel and Keeley's theme. You know, every time they start talking, or any time she's, like, cramming, like, King's Foil into her, it, like, you <laughs> hear the theme. It's like, called Feast of Starlight. That's, yes. That's what it's called, which and, is a reference to... And it's the only memorable theme I can get out of the Hobbit trilogy. I can't tell you. I can't. I can't tell you any theme from the first Hobbit movie. Here's the theme from Lake Town. Vum dum 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 dum. Vum dum 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 dum. Remember that? That was a really yeah. good Lake motif. <laughs> the Lake Town theme is really I like cool. Lake Town. It's it's not as it's like uh, in your face as the theme for Rohan, which everybody remembers forever. But I I remembered it after half the viewings you have seen. Half the okay. half the viewings I remember. Theme from Lake Town, and I love it. I think it's great. But um, but I, in Lord of the I'm Rings the again, Shore every fan. single theme, almost every single theme in Lord of the Rings was memorable. The Rohan theme, like the Gondor theme, the Nth theme, like uh, the Balrog theme, uh, the oh, main Fellowship theme. theme. Like every like as soon you can hear two notes and be like, yes, I'm in. Do you know the Erebor theme? Do you guys remember it now after having seen both of these movies? Bum bum. Bum bum, bum bum. Do, 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 do. Jurassic Park. No, that's it. Six <laughs> notes. Six notes. That's it. The theme from Erebor is only those six notes. Do you think there's a difference because uh, uh, Howard it Shore over isn't over composing, again. the music isn't orchestrated. He's not conducting. 
he's not? Yeah. No, it's all over the, the, the latest uh, uh, video thing. Like, Howard Shore does not do any conducting on The Hobbit. Oh, it says music composed by Howard Shore, but it doesn't say conducted by. Yep. Ah, Big difference. That's very interesting. So last time you were here, you had seen the movie, and you were kind of like just wanting to go in with open eyes, and, and were you... Did anything surpass... Like, we've talked a lot about what we didn't like. Did anything surpass your expectations? All right. See, the thing is, I actually really liked this movie. But the reason for it is because I really like elves. I just really, really loved... All right. Thranduil <laughs> is this special character that no matter how high my expectations for him are, he always surpasses and them. And he did! And he it did. comes out <gasps> better than I thought it would be. He was spooky. Ah. He was weird. Oh, the dragon He face? had dragon what? battle damage. I've always just wanted to see elves get punched in the face a little bit. Just get roughed up because they never <laughs> do. And battle I just damaged like, elves. Battle damaged elves. And I was just so happy at that part i was just you know like when Leg legolas is like it was made perfect me oh my god <laughs> so happy i spent three movies just wanting legolas to get like a little just a little you know a little <laughs> tooth knocked out or something like that just you know that's uh, true. we finally got that 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 fight club thing like i just wanted to destroy something beautiful like i we finally got the bloody nose yeah, we did i was i was intrigued and somebody texted us on the hotline just a, a little while ago saying what's with the half Torn off face and scars on Thranduil. That was awesome. <laughs> that was so fascinating. So good. To hear him, and, and Lee Pace is such a great actor. Oh my he god! Perfect casting. Perfect. Yeah, great perfect casting. Perfect acting. He, perfect execution everything. of his lines. He, okay, we're talking about hisses at Thorin and says, "Don't talk to me about the worms of the north. I know what they're like. I've dealt with them." And all of a sudden, half of his face is gone. And I wondered, what are the mechanics of this? spell or this concealment what are the mechanics of this magic that the elves can have horrible wounds and yet disguise them this has never been discussed in the world of tolkien in any books i've ever read it's fascinating to me. but it was I did good like, it, it was, was very good. good it was super cool i just like the very idea good. that it's like that that thranduil almost like that it's this is his secret you know there's like elves yeah. are, they, they don't show yeah. visible wounds you just don't see maimed elves walking around they're either perfectly fine uh -huh. and clean and not bleeding and, and and if they are bleeding they are dead or dying mm -hmm. that's it's just across the board if they're injured they are dead so it's just like i think for i i posted a, a, a i made a post on this on uh, on tumblr <laughs> a while back where i was just like you know thinking about the idea of like beauty pr particularly like unmarred like faces and stuff is equaling immortality to the elves and like how what that meant that so like you know having visible scars would be like taboo almost so that was yeah. just like something i was thinking about i was oh. really interested about i'll go and read that i will go and read that because i was just like I, I laughed i laughed i legolas makes me laugh he's my favorite but <laughs> i find him <laughs> hilarious um so when he like yes. touches his nose and he's got like blood on his hand and he's like oh my god i'm so mad i'm like <laughs> i thought it was really funny and then i like thought a little bit more about it i'm just like how do we know that Legolas has ever like bled before you know like, he's a very sheltered like elven prince like the elves don't leave Mirkwood very much like mm -hmm. I don't know how often they fight like he clearly knows how to fight but I mean probably in a more controlled environment he's never gotten his ass kicked like this before that's <laughs> right oh yeah so like that's true like what that's was true. it like what really made him so mad about that and was part of that being like like angry that someone had kind of like threatened his immortality mm -hmm. I guess to some extent uh, which seems to be like a big motivator of Thrawn duels as well, as well, where he's like, I don't want to fight that dragon. I, I don't want tried before. Us, like, close I am, I am happy being immortal and never dying ever, and I am not going anywhere near that dragon. And Here. Here's a comment from one of our fans on the hotline. Uh, Hello, sexy Hobbit, and you are quite a sexy Hobbit. <laughs> but listen to this. In this in this opinion, our fan says the Hobbit, as a project, was rushed. Peter Jackson and his team had way more time with Lord of the Rings. No, they didn't. But there is something to be said about the editorial decision to go from two films to three films. That caused this to happen. Bog disappears and gets reinvented as CGI Bog. Uh, uh, a climactic set piece like the barrels out of Bond goes from being the end of the first film to being the middle piece of the second film when it's changed to a three film structure. So perhaps there is something to be said about the filmmakers having to run around a little bit more cray cray after they switched gears to make it three films. I believe ardently, and I will say this to anybody 
it would have been better, perhaps, <laughs> if they had just kept The Hobbit as a two-film work. Yeah, I, I really do think so. I think that, like, the reason, and especially since he's not only being like, okay, I'll make two, I'll make three movies, I'm still going to keep them at three hours each, though. <laughs> and it's just like, I feel like, especially my second viewing, where the kind of the first one I was, I stayed engaged because I was, I was waiting for the elves to come back in. But on my second viewing, I knew mm. exactly which parts the elves were in, and so I'm like, okay, this is the part where there are no elves, I can kind of... And then that, that last that last scene with the dragon made it just way too clear where it's like, oh, you have these scenes and they're killing time. Whereas, like, in the original trilogy, we stuck with this absurdly long... I still watch the extended version of Return of the King every time, which is close to, what, four hours long altogether? Um, three hours and 42 minutes. Yes, yeah, it's fantastic. And that does yeah. not feel as long to me as the Hobbit movies do. Because and Desolation yeah. of Smaug is, ironically, the shortest running time of all of the Middle-earth movies. Yeah. At two hours, 41 minutes. But it's still, it like... In Return of the King, everything that they were doing tied into the plot, and it was like, they were doing these cool things along the way, but they always had a goal. So, like, when you have this long scene in The Desolation of Smog, where it's just like, let's dip the dragon in some gold, <laughs> and then there's no payoff for that, and he shakes it off immediately and continues doing what he was about to do 30 minutes ago. Yeah. Like... It yep. feels like they're stalling, like they're trying to drag it out, and I'm just like, just you need to tell your story, and like, I, I feel like they're focusing on the wrong things, giving too much time to the wrong things. Hmm. Interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm with you on that most of most of the way. I'm with you on that most of the way. I would have, I would have liked to have seen them do something to show Thorin as a leader and show him to be really ballsy and really assertive. And this is what we got. But there could have been many other things that Thorin could have done to be assertive. Um, I don't think that anybody in the, a film audience would have been satisfied if Thorin just sat outside the mountain on the doorstep and did nothing. I don't think that would have worked in the film at all. But, but then again, like I said, you introduce weird complications about, you know, why is it Smaug can't see or smell when the dwarves are right there underneath the portcullis are right under the little walkway and, and there's all sorts of complications when you introduce characters no, no, who no, were never there. The only there. thing I was bummed out about the dwarves was like they gave up at the door. Like, oh, we can't find the door. The sun yeah, exactly. Oh, that, that was yeah. the other thing. They, yeah, they had to make it so that the dwarves <laughs> couldn't leave, you know? And I'm just like, Smog's not gonna, like, you're, you just wait for a little while and then sneak back out. It's not gonna be that hard, you yeah. know? Like, <laughs> I, they treated it as this big, like, defeatist thing, and that was supposed to be Thorin's moment where he's like, we can come back from this. I am the awesome leader. Yeah, it just that didn't work been the, that, that way. I agree. That would have been the moment to show Thorin being the assertive leader. And they tried to do that, but what we got was uh, this molten gold plot and <laughs> wheelbarrows down rivers of gold, and I just didn't... It wasn't successful. So you didn't like anything in the movie except for Thranduil? And the elves? I liked Lake Town. <laughs> I like Bard. He's okay. I like. He's fine. He's fine. I just really like Thranduil. What, what, like what, a lot. What about Thran? What What about Bard's family? Like a lot of people were have an issue. Like, oh, he has a daughter. Oh, I I just was really happy that we had three women in a room at the same time, which is like probably a record for Lord of the Rings. <laughs> oh yeah. This is the closest. <laughs> if you guys don't know what the Bechdel test is, it's yes. a um, it's a test where if you go to see a movie. Uh, two women have to talk to each other about something other than men. It's a very simple test, and surprisingly, many movies don't pass. None of the Lord of the Rings movies have passed so far, understandably, since I don't think any female characters have even talked to each other uh, at all about anything That was so originally far. from a very, very popular uh, lesbian comic strip, I think. Uh, yeah, Dykes to Watch Out For. Dykes to Watch yeah. Out For. Yeah, that was, yeah, that's where that... Brilliant and still applicable Yes, today. it's still, it's still very, very so. interesting to watch yeah. the trends. Um, so this one came the closest. I think technically one of the daughters like yells the name of the other daughter, so maybe even passes almost a little bit closer than it ever has been before in the mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings movies. So. I, feel, I feel like it would have been cool, like if, if they're going to go this far as far as like introducing female characters into a, a story that had no girls whatsoever, mm -hmm. like may, maybe they should have made uh, uh, one of the daughters like the, the, the one that's interested in, you know, taking up dad's fishing and like hiding the the black spear and stuff. That like would have been that. cool. Like, there, there's so many ways they could have done that. I feel like I, I did like I legitimately like Tariel. I feel like they didn't go far enough. Like, why did she seem to be the only female elven guard? Like, it seems like not a big deal that she is because again, with elves similar to dwarves, there's just not a big difference between elf elf women and elf men. So, 
they probably share a lot of the same jobs. I just, mm. but I didn't see any other female guards besides her. And I'm just like, what is the reason for that? Like, if there had been more, she was captain. She, yeah, her but, highest rank, captain of the guard. But there's there there aren't any others, so it, it makes it even weirder by comparison. I don't remember seeing any other female elves at all in Mirkwood. In the background or anything. They're probably there. And like, granted, it is hard you know to tell I at a glimpse. I didn't either. But I, like, and I've, I've looked very carefully. Um, we do get some fun things that are inconsistent with Lord of the Rings, like drunk elves. <laughs> when, but you know, we needed Michaelis, that. You Michaelis needed that. That's no in the book. He gets no effect on the alcohol he's well, drinking. All right, in Rohan, they were probably towels. drinking like the equivalent of Bud Light. And then elf, <laughs> elf wine, <laughs> they were even talking about this was Thrandul's <laughs> special store of wine. If anything is going to get them drunk, it's, it's probably like magically strong. Say too, what you will you about know? the king's temperament, yes. but he has excellent taste in wine. <laughs> 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 That's really And I like that Thranduil makes is doing is doing business with Lake Town, you know, with the barrels and stuff like that. Like now, here's here's where I think the writers got something very very correct and very very good. There was more discussion about the economic fallout of Dale being destroyed after the dragon's attack, and the fact that Lake Town, which is mentioned by Thorin explicitly as being the center, the greatest center of trade in the north. Remember? When he mm -hmm. says something like that? And then you realize that there's no more Dale, and, and there's no more gold coming from Erebor, and no more trade. So the only way for the people in Lake Town to scrabble and survive over the next 171 years was to just n do what meager trade they could do with the woodland realm. And so the desolation of Smaug gets a double meaning. It can be the burnt and charred land, but it can also be the economic desolation of Smaug after, you know, he destroyed Erebor and Dale. Uh, I, do, I do appreciate that. Um, I think those are some extra layers of meaning uh, to the words, and um, that's correct. It is true that those people in that community could not survive unless they had some interconnectedness with the woodland realm. Who? Op operates on a completely isolationist policy, completely isolationist, and that was interesting to me. Um, whether or not we're going to explore any more of that thematically in the third film, I do not know. <laughs> I do not know. Oh, look at these messages coming. I, I, I think like someone just texted us saying Legolas is like a fancy car. You can't just give him anything. I think that it means the level of petrol. That is a that's a <laughs> direct quote from I think the commentary on one of the movies though. I really? Think, yeah, I'm on to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and I, I'm with you. Watching Return of the King Extended Edition is the best because you get the full Saruman closure. Oh, I love scene. that part. Isn't oh my great? god, it's so great. He's just like... Yeah, it's really, really, so great. really great. Love um, it. Have a Skype call. Let's try to answer this this time. Okay. Oh, hello. It's Emily. Hello. Hold on, let's do speaker. Hold on. Oh. Now we can. Hello. Happy New Year, Doctor. Happy Hi. New Year. Hi, Hi Emily. Yeah. So I don't think many people like this Justin chat. <laughs> What's wrong with it? Oh, the Justin oh, chat? The, trying to get in in the first place and having to sign up to write everything and people getting lag and pause and ads and stuff. Well, there's less ads than Ustream. Like, uh, the Ustream, like, we had an ad every five minutes. Yeah, but the people in the chat have said that they would tolerate the ads to have the, the clarity of use and the ease of use that they had previously with Ustream. Yeah, I mean, I, I got ads every, every ten minutes. I got, like, a minute, ten, well, ten to twenty minutes, you got a minute of ads. But at least like, it was easy to come in and use the chat originally. Right. I, I had to sign up, and it took like forever to try and actually get it to actually sign me up. Oh, duly noted. Use it. All right, we'll let we'll let the people at Justin TV know that they need to make this thing easier. Yeah, because I mean, when I originally came in with UStream, you could come in, and it w you wouldn't have a name. You just have a it just have say a set of numbers, and it would let me um, just come in. But I signed, so I had a name. But with this one, I couldn't come in and just write anything. I had before it would even let me. I had to sign up before it, I could actually write anything. All right, duly noted. We'll uh, we'll keep looking into it. Again, we just changed that uh, yesterday, so we're uh, we're still working through it. But back to desolation. What you said? You don't remember any of the theme tunes from the first movie. But what about the Lonely Mountain song and Thorin's song? 
I remember that Sorry one. Sorry for Misty Mountains. No, the song oh, of yeah, Misty Mountains. That, that, but th that's that's that script. That, that's in the script. That, that's but they, dialogue. They, they, they composed, they made the tune for it. They made the tune for it, yes. But that, that that's a scripted dialogue. Like, I'm talking about m themes. Just orchestral themes? Or just orchestral but they, themes. But they use that as the theme. I, I think when the dwarves are walking... I remember that yeah. one. So okay, there, okay yeah, yeah, that one's good. That, yeah, yeah. Also, good point. Good point. And also, I finally got myself the uh, first movie as a birthday present. Oh, oh perfect! Excellent. There's the soundtrack. Very good. Yeah. It so was I've got actually both now. it was Plan Nine who composed that ultra memorable piece of score for the Song of the Misty Mountains. <laughs> that was not even a Howard Shore piece. Howard. Howard, where are you at, man? Are you phoning, are you phoning it in? Where he's are you totally at, phoning it in. And he's letting Conrad Pope do all the orchestrations and not yeah. and, and the conducting. I bet you he doesn't even get off the couch to orchestrate, to, to write down notes. Like, he's just like, ah, you know, I just had dinner. Let me have a glass of wine and write some music. <laughs> Thank you, Hobbit fan, for joining our show. We will see all you right, next so week. All right, uh, so what is your favorite part of the movie? We need positivity this episode. <laughs> Favorite part of the movie. Oh, man, your Smog. hesitation is the answer. Smog. So e e Although, everything. I, I must. I must admit. I was so tired. I went. I went to the cinema to see it for the second time in two D, with a friend on Thursday, and I'd had. I just had hardly any sleep the night before. So I fell asleep from getting on Bard's barge till they were arrested for breaking into the armory. How can you fall asleep during Lake Town? Like, that's the most... That's the <laughs> Stephen Colbert. Because I had had no sleep the night before. You know, that... that I, 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 you stay up way too late, darling. You <laughs> stay up way too late. Which is lovely that you're here for us this late when I know it's after 2 in the morning where you are. Yeah, it's quarter past 2. Quarter past 2 a.m. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Closing time. La la la! I forget the words. Whatever. Anyway. Well, do, do you have any questions before we uh, jump in on another call? Um. I think I've talked about me. Can I tell you, Stargate Geek? Since I have you on the horn right here, my favorite sequence, and will continue to be my favorite sequence, was. Gandalf trying to find his way through Dol Guldur and him coming face to face with what became the manifestation of Sauron. I thought that was beautifully realized. Um, even though it, 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 challenged, it challenged the canon of the books in a big way, but I still thought it was beautifully realized and really cool to watch. Yeah, I, I actually, the first, when I was watching it in, in the 48 frames per second, I didn't notice that as such. Whereas when I was watching it in 2D, I did notice it a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the um, I like I like the way that Sauron appears as uh, this flaming uh, silhouette of himself, and then it's shown within the iris. Uh, he is the pupil of the eye, and then the camera seems to go into zooming into infinity into the eye, the flaming eye of Sauron. I thought can, it was so cool. Can you talk about like what Gandalf is doing well, during that scene, my, though? My like, I. Still, uh, okay. Are we, all right. All right. Well, um. I I it's just, just it's just so subtle. Wait, what yeah. are you talking about now? Did we? All right, well, th thanks for calling. We're <laughs> gonna jump on another uh, call. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. What were you saying? I just wanted to know what Gandalf's plan was going there at all. Like he he sends Radagast away and says it's undoubtedly a trap, and then seems surprised that he ends up in a cage. I'm just like, <laughs> what were you trying to accomplish, Gandalf? It's most definitely a trap. He knew it. He I, knew it was a trap. I, he knew he couldn't. I don't know what he thought he could do there by himself. Uh, he couldn't have just gone with Radagast to get Gladriel and then come back. I'm really excited about where this is going, by the way. I really want to see Gladriel, you know, oh, man. get out all her moves. And, and uh, show up, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, in but the first film, Galadriel says, the riddle of the Morgul blade must be answered. So she has said directly to Gandalf, we need to find out why this Morgul blade is here, how could it possibly exist, and why did Radagast find it in this particular place? But Saruman is not present in that room, he's not present there at all, because he's the naysayer, and he keeps saying, no, you don't need to worry about this, nothing's happening, you can leave it alone, because I'm, I'm sure Saruman has his own designs, and he's looking around for you-know-what. 
Have you seen the, uh, the 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 behind the scenes videos where they show Thranduil like doing spins with swords and stuff like that? I think it's like, safe to assume that I've seen like as much Thranduil <laughs> material as has been released <laughs> <laughs> on repeat. As <laughs> <gifts>. <laughs> Kind of, yeah. <laughs> like, do you, where do you think that takes place? Do you think he's fighting inside? Oh, I thought I assumed it was the Battle of Five Armor, uh, Five Armies. Yeah. But it, do you think he starts fighting at, in Mirkwood and then jumps over to the mountain? Because that, that the pathways. That assume that something is going to happen with Legolas and Tariel that kind of forces uh, Thranduil to come after them in some way. I'm not sure what, but I feel like. Thranduil is definitely going to come there and not to Dol Guldur. Um, hmm. I don't know what exactly, but like it has to be important that Legolas and Tariel are already there. And I feel like either they're going to send a message to Thranduil or something and be like, but they're we need you. Already. Well, Legolas is probably going to come back, either that or get like captured by orcs or something, and then Thranduil will have to show up and get his kid back. Legolas is now, uh, at the end of the film, on I really don't know where they're going with He's that. chasing Balg somewhere, and we don't know where they're Either going. Either they're going to start out... Balg. I feel like what most likely is going to happen is they're going to start out in the next movie with, like, a battle between him and Balg, and then he's going to kill Balg, and then he's going to come back, and it's going to be anticlimactic. But I would like, <laughs> like it to lead... I'd like him to either <laughs> find something while he's out there, or follow the orcs somewhere, so, like, you know, achieve some kind of end while he's, while he's chasing... Bulk. My thought, my thought is that the, the why they set up the ending like this is that he's chasing Balg back to Dol Guldur, and mm. and then he gets to Dol Guldur. So uh, Radagast and freaking Galadriel have to go rescue Gandalf. Thranduil has to go rescue his son, and so Thranduil is forced to confront. Oh my God, Sauron's back. This is no joke. I'm not. I can't just close my borders because Thranduil is like but, close okay. the borders. We're out. Aren't the orcs mm. going to the Lonely Mountain though? When don't they leave? And Gandalf is in the cage, and they are marching yep, out. They're, they're right, leaving, ah, so yes. they're going to go. I think that's where Thranduil needs to go. He he has to be with the dwarves. That's the important part. That is what resolves their arc together. Was there was some mm. behind the scenes shot of all of them together at uh, Lake Town? Yeah. Yeah. The thread. So we know thread. Okay. Yeah. And and we see we see Legolas with Bard at some point in one of the promo stills. So Legolas definitely comes back to Lake Town. Yeah. Um. That might have just been a behind the scenes little. Maybe. Bit. Um. But you couldn't ask for two more handsome bookends than Orlando Bloom and and uh, and uh, Luke Evans right there side by side. Bard looks what? so much like Orlando Bloom though. Oh, like, totally. From Will t as Will Turner. As yeah, Will yeah. Turner, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's a combination between the two. There it is. Like they've they they they've used the uh, actors in multiple roles in so many things. They could have just had. You know. <laughs> Which is weird because oh. I feel like the reason that they also like changed. All right, okay, the bow and arrow thing. Like Bard was a bowman. Like he was supposed right. to be an archer, and they didn't have a big old turret gun, uh, art, like bow and arrow thing. So and I, I feel like the reason that they changed that is because he would. Well, I think we would be like, well, why doesn't Legolas just shoot him while he's here? Like, we've already established that Legolas is a really good shot. So, like, there has to be a reason that it's Bard and not Legolas or Tariel. Hmm. Um, and, you know, the only dwarf with a bow and arrow is Keeley. And he happens to be in Lake Town now. I feel like Keeley wouldn't be able to draw a bow far enough, though. Do you think... His, his arms are too short. Do you think they're going to change the book? Do you think Bard won't be the guy that delivers a crushing I blow? I doubt it. it. I be. think it has to be... It's it ha so built up to be that... There's a there's the dwarven wind lance up at the top of the building where the master of Lake Town resides and and everyone's talking about it while they're in Bard's house. Who's got the one remaining black arrow from his ancestor, Bard? Who actually put on that makeup and played Geryon, Lord of Dale? It was Luke Evans. It was Luke Evans okay. himself playing his ancestor. So that's all right there. That's your Aragorn, you know, hered her line of kingship type of thing. Maybe in the third film, we'll get to see something like the beautiful restoration of Dale, and we'll get to see Bard leave see Lake Town. Oh, come on. They filmed a lot of stuff in, in Dale. <coughs> and all the actors, everybody I talked to said, haven't you gone up to visit the set of Dale before they burned it down? It was so gorgeous. It was so amazing. It's the most beautiful thing we've ever built. Before <laughs> we had to burn it, you know, and show the, the charred remains of it. That was just for the intro. No, I no, 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 no. That was barely three minutes of Dale. I've got a feeling in the third film, we will see Bard and his whole family brought back to some place, 
some some higher station repopulate in life and 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 begin the repopulation of Dale. And that's why he has daughters. You know what? I have got a feeling the third film is going to jump cut huge amounts of decades, and we're even going to see some of the survivors of Thorin and company going to repopulate Moria. Ah, oh, and we all know how that works out for them. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. But look at look at the problems they might have with filling the third film with uh, with enough plot. You've got the death of the dragon, maybe if the dragon even dies. That's a spoiler. <laughs> and then you've got the battle of the five armies, and then what's left after that? Th- that there's a whole movie to fill up, and so well, well they're we, probably going to drag out the death of the dragon a lot. Uh, and the Battle of Five Armies. I mean, how long was yeah. the Battle of Pelennor Field? Like, and, and we've got uh, mm, Galadriel mm. going on Ooh, the warpath. So we've got that as well. Yes. Oh, man. Okay, um, yeah. Who's going to rescue Gandalf? The biggest question mark why I'm still scratching my head is why didn't Gandalf use Elven Ring telepathy to talk to Galadriel? He sends Radagast off and says, go send a message to Galadriel. Well, he does have very fast rabbits. I <laughs> he does very fast rabbits. <laughs> Oh my god! I can't believe I can't believe I you wonder. guys don't like so much about the movie. Like, li- like everything, the, everyone in the chat room is uh, accurately pointing out. Like, you guys don't like anything. Except I, I really did like the movie. That's the thing. I just so how can you not like all this stuff and then accept Randall and then be like, I like the movie. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, I love the movie. I love everything about it. I love the. Global I mean, just because I didn't, I, I, I didn't. I act like I didn't like actively lot. not enjoy the parts that didn't have elves in them. You know, like I thought that <laughs> Lake Town was really well designed and was really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I did not. I didn't really like the parts with the dragon. Besides the an, initial scene in the treasure room, I I don't know why. I actually really like dragons in general, <laughs> so uh, it just didn't. Um, I liked I liked Bjorn. He was. Didn't do much, but he was yeah. there. He was pretty cool. He didn't he was a bear. have enough time, did he? I wouldn't even. Bayorn, yeah. Bayorn didn't have enough screen time. I really liked what little bit I saw. Did you see? Uh, did, you, did you see the the little smile? Yes, I did see that. That was so cute. <laughs> 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 that, that on our Instagram dot com slash the wondering net. You like that? Uh, there, we, we posted Smaug's daily affirmations, and it's a little baby Smaug looking in the mirror saying, I am fire, I am death. <laughs> oh, how cute. <laughs> well, you know, there's, there's a lot to love about the desolation of Smaug. I really loved the visualizations of the woodland realm, and what was it like going into the caverns where Thranduil's halls are, and gosh, I thought that the whole doll gold door stuff was cool, although some of our friends in the chat room said that the movie jumped the shark at that point when Gandalf was face to face with Sauron. Was Sauron. What? Out. But I, what? I thought Are you guys crazy? That was I, awesome. I thought it was pretty cool. How do you make How do you make a flaming eye be born and make everybody as scared of it? Like now, here's the thing. What about my now? My my friend Jure, who has not seen the Lord of the Rings and is watching the Hobbit films first, he has no idea the impact of these images. He does not know the relevance of seeing a ghost come out of the statue and stab at Radagast. And he certainly doesn't understand this flaming, lidless eye. The, the motif, the visual uh, iconography is alien to him because he has not read The Lord of the Rings or seen the movies. So, again, it begs the question, who's going to get more bang for their buck if they see Lord of the Rings first and then see Hobbit next? Or should they see all six in chronological order? I put that question to you, my friend. What do you think? Um, it's difficult to say. I think because I have seen <laughs> The Lord of the Rings so many mm-hmm. times that it's mm-hmm. really impossible for me to... I think I went to see the movie with my friend Daphna, who, uh... That's a lovely Was name, like... Daphna. She was like... like you know, forgetting everyone's name. She's like, oh, what was his name? Like, the elf. I was like, it's Legolas. Like, how could you not know that? I was just so <laughs> amazed at her, at the fact that, like, she was like, oh, yeah. Take this seriously. And, and, like, the wizard with the hat. I was like, Gandalf, how do you not know that? It's like saying, like, oh, who's, like, the kid with the glasses who is a wizard? Like, how could you not <laughs> know something like that? But I, and I have to, like, accept at some point that, like, this was really emphasized in my life as I was growing up. Um, and it might not have been for everybody. So it's really hard for me to, like, come at it from the perspective of someone who really doesn't know uh, what these images mean. Um, I ha- it hadn't actually occurred to me until you said that, that, the, the, like, that would be really strange out of context. The, the Radagast having his first encounter in Dol Guldur in An Unexpected Journey is meant to make everyone who's familiar with Lord of the Rings go, gasp, 
That's one of the ring wraiths, right there. That's, that's what you're supposed to gasp about. People who haven't seen them don't even know. They don't even know what that is. We just so, got a text message saying, Georgia is watching. Hi, Hello. Georgia. Hi, Georgia. Hey, Georgia. So, uh, the, the, you know, hey, one, one of the other things, <laughs> as long as you're here, because we're, we're, we're getting close to end Dang, of the show. Already? Oh, my gosh. Uh, that was such but, a quick 90 minutes. Yeah, well, right. One of the things, like... Oh. One of the things, uh, like make a Lord of the Rings movie in ninety minutes. You try. You're, <laughs> you go ahead and try. <laughs> One thing that was cool about Broship was that you, the the characters were so developed and so fleshed out in Lord of the Rings that when you when you did Broship, like it totally made sense. You know, but every single character had a very like it, it was it, like every character was so unique mm -hmm. that it was it it made sense, uh, and and you could create. You, uh, these unique parodies. Um, I, uh, do you feel that uh, The Hobbit has the same amount of character exploration? I don't think you could do a, a bro ship type thing with the ho uh, with Hobbit characters. There just isn't enough uniqueness yeah. in between. Like an elf is an elf is an elf. A dwarf is a dwarf is a dwarf. Yeah, like, yeah, um, yeah. I a, am that. I missing something, some nuances here that 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 mm. are supposed to be there that aren't? Yeah, no, I I agree. I mean, I think this was a, mostly a problem with the first one. That was one of the biggest problems because it did focus so much on the 13 dwarves and there was so little character development for them. Uh, some of them never speak. Most of them most just of them. don't speak very much at all. <laughs> like, most of them have uh, one or two lines. Yeah, but Jed Brophy <laughs> had one line and Bomber had none. Mm -hmm. In three hours. Yeah, yeah. 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 And um, it's just, yeah, I... Like, by the end of Fellowship, by the end of the first movie, every character was so well-developed and yes. unique, yeah. and we had seen either some flashbacks yes. or whatever that, that like, here's his identity, you know, Sam is the loyal, you know, follower. But I guess maybe it is a little unfair to compare the two even, because the Fellowship had the, uh, the upper hand of being able to include lots of different people's in the group so it's like mm. legolas is just the elf that's really the extent of his personality and it's okay because he <laughs> is the only elf uh keely or yeah. uh, uh gimli is the dwarf he's the only dwarf um uh, aragorn and boromir have distinct personalities and the hobbits have distinct personalities and gandalf is the wizard and already you just have a more diverse group um and then like you know there's parts where like uh pippin and mary a lot of people get them mixed up they're very similar but mm -hmm. it's also like that's okay because they function as best friends who are always pretty much together they're all, until yeah. the last movie so it's okay that it's like you don't have to really tell them apart if you don't mm -hmm. want to um <laughs> I so i that. think that it's just it's it's just gonna be harder to do that i i admire the efforts that they made with the with the dwarf company to distinguish them from each other uh, design wise but it would be very difficult to accomplish a similar thing with that group of dwarves indeed out of out of all the stuff i've seen radagast in these movies and a couple of other characters are the most worthy of Broship of the Ring parody. I could see you very easily taking that classic, it's now classic, like that line where Sylvester McCoy says, These are Roscabel rabbits. I'd like to see them try. You could take that and have fun with that eight ways from Tuesday. And, and you know. I didn't like Radigas. You didn't like Radigas. I, oh, like oh, I but, can't tell if it was just because he had bird poo on his face the entire <laughs> time or what, but well, I just. He was one of the most not, distinct characters. He, he was distinct. He could bird poo on his face. <laughs> I just, I didn't do it for me. Uh, I, I think the birds play a critical role in the third movie. I'm, I'm I just, think Radagast is going to die. I think he dies and Gandalf takes his staff because his staff looks very similar to Gandalf's staff in The Fellowship of the Ring. Yeah, and Gandalf has of, just been broken. So yeah, A lot of rumor about that, that now we know what happens mm. to Gandalf's early staff and everyone was questioning it last year. Why does Gandalf's staff look like that? And now we know that Radagast is the one that It's also like just weird. I mean, I guess it's Gandalf's. not that weird that Radagast isn't involved at all in the events of, um, you know, the Lord of the Rings. But I guess I do yeah. still kind of wonder. I'm like, I mean, I don't think he would be necessarily the guy to call in that situation. Um, but... It would make sense, I guess, for just from a movie viewer's perspective to be like, who is this character who's in this movie and doesn't appear at all in this movie? Like, um, when we kind of at least know where the characters from The Hobbit end up, generally speaking, except mm -hmm. for Radagast. Out of, out of the company of dwarves, 
Which ones would you like to parody, or do you think you could, as an artist, easily parody? Here, here, hand me the hand me the buffer, please. Would you? I, I, which I, parts I, of the Hobbit could I parody? Oh, which dwarves? I, which which dwarves? dwarves could you? Parody? I don't think you do can you do any. Like they're they're all. Just well, I did I did Feely and Keely. Oh yeah, those are uh, easy. yeah, they're, exactly. Those are easy because they they look different. I, I like, think they don't who's, have the who's the sweater dwarf? I forgot his name. I don't know the dwarf's names. I'm sorry. The sweater dwarf. Sweater dwarf. Sweater dwarf. He wears a lot of sweaters. He's like the young one. Oh, that's Ori. 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 Yeah, Ori. yeah, yeah that's Ori. I, I could do a pretty. He wears a lot of sweaters. I <laughs> like drawing sweaters. I would draw him. <laughs> do you know Ori is supposed to be the scribe and he's supposed and to be yeah. constantly recording? He's the one. He's, he's the, the one, one that uh, the skeleton the that Pippin pushes yeah. down a well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So his ultimate fate is down a well. No, 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 no. Yeah. Well, no, well, the, the, there was He's another... He's over the fellowship with his bones. No, there was another dwarf corpse <laughs> down on the ground. <laughs> you guys, I hate to say this, but and, and we're trying to close the show, but you have confused your dwarven corpses. <laughs> there was a different dwarf corpse on the ground, and <laughs> Gandalf takes the book. Oh, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Okay, all right, sorry. It's a different one. It's a different <laughs> my one. bad, but, but, my uh, bad. Uh, I mean, we've seen it at several conventions last year. Like, we saw almost the whole company of dwarves at Dragon Con. Mm -hmm. They were all cosplayers. Uh, they were all women, um, oh, and, yeah, but one of the big see. things that, that I've noticed the difference between Lord of the Rings and, and The Hobbit uh, 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 on a fan perspective and a cosplay perspective is that um, uh, Hobbit cosplay and Hobbit art is, is all about fidelity to the movie and the characters. There isn't a lot of room for interpretations, mm -hmm. whereas... Uh, with Lord of the Rings, they were so the characters, everything in Lord of the Rings was so well developed that you're able to riff off of that into a, a, a unique creation. And I feel like The Hobbit is missing something that doesn't allow extension. It, does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. <laughs> um, I think that's why I really do connect to the Mirkwood plot more than to the Dwarf plot. There's just hmm. so many of them, and they are... I mean, it's. I mean, in the book, there's there's no reason to tell the difference between each dwarf. They're they're the same. They have different color hoods, but they're more or less the same. Mm -hmm. um, they function as one unit. Uh, you don't care which dwarf is bouncing down the stairs. It is it is a one of them. It doesn't really matter. Um, except Bomber's the fat one. You know, there's like little like one little one line descriptors for each of them. But you know, then you have Mirkwood, and it's just kind of like you have this. You have distinct characters, and you have characters with complex relationships between themselves, um, and that just kind of is easier to, uh, is, well, it's easier to connect with, I guess, for me anyway. Um, I'm sure that my experience is not either the, the only one or even the most common one, but that's how I feel. Uh, before we go, and a lot of friends are asking, Noel, please tell us about your artwork and where we can find your stuff online because people are asking, who is our special guest? And <laughs> I'm afraid we did a very poor job of introducing our special guest. Poor so shame. let's remedy that. <laughs> okay, um, my name is Noel Stevenson. Uh, I run a Tumblr under the name Ginger Hayes. I run a webcomic called Nimona. And I did a, par a, a, a series of parody comics based on the Lord of the Rings trilogy called The Broship of the Ring, mm -hmm. which is a version of Lord of the Rings if it were set in the modern day without magic or fantasy races. So, uh, you know, so the hobbits are hipsters, Gandalf is an old hippie, stuff like that. Um, look me up on Tumblr, gingerhaze.tumblr.com to see those pictures. Very fun stuff. I love the, the light touch that you have with your artwork. I love your character design. It, the broship of the ring is very, very funny and takes a good hard thwack at some of the tropes of modern pop culture cast into the light of Lord of the Rings. You guys will enjoy it. Definitely check out Ginger Hayes on Tumblr. And Party Thranduil. Oh, and Party Thranduil. Party yeah, Thranduil, like, yes! The, w w the evolution that's of that one. Party Thranduil, do you, can you pinpoint like where that originated? Was it kind of like already happening on the scene and you just put it to pen? or? Well, I, th I talked a little bit about this last time. There was a card that it was like the first image of Thranduil that was leaked it had this description attached to it that was like, oh, Thranduil is the king. And then it had this one line where it said, nobody knows how to throw a party like King Thranduil, which oh, was yeah. obviously and the one to latch like onto. Like and it just like, it was really obvious to me that he needed to wear a pair of pink shutter shades and be dancing <laughs> with a solo cup. <laughs> and it just happened really quickly all in one day. Everyone was kind of excited about the same thing. I feel like the, the Hobbit fan and um, uh, everybody just kind of, it just happened. It was just, it was the obvious joke, I think, to make <laughs> at that point. But really good, as far fun. as I know, I was the first one to make it. 
I'm not sure though. Mm -hmm. Like it is I, I think it is very likely that someone could have had the same idea Fan stuff separately. Just happens, but it's true, it's true. It's oh, this yeah. is great. Look, um uh Ragamuffin says, um Bro Ship is you? Cool. <laughs> That's me. And Bofer's wife me. says, I love her Tumblr page. It's amazing. Indeed, you guys. We have all kinds of creative folks and really good Tolkien fans on our show of every possible stripe. Now, I, all, all gender politics aside, um, do you think that if Peter had been working with Guillermo del Toro and there wasn't that much of a direct influence uh, with his own PJ influence as we have now, <laughs> how much different would all of our conversations be about The Hobbit? Do you think they would have stayed as two films only? Do you think Guillermo del Toro would have delivered a whole different level of Hobbit? What do you think? I'm very curious to know. I liked what he did with the female character in Pacific Rim. I loved, I love his female like, character. She was way f fleshed yeah. out, like her past, her present, and her future. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, loved it. I loved Pacific Rim. Really did. And well, I, I feel like I'm, I'm missing some of that. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. In, in I, I legitimately <laughs> don't know. Um, I really liked Pacific Rim, but I've never thought to kind of say that I wish that Lord of the Rings was more like Pacific Rim. Um, I, I think I, the big heartbreak for me with Pacific Rim even, even though I loved it, is that it does have these awesome characters who are in the background and never, they die very quickly and I yeah. love them. I am a big fan of the Russian couple who never oh. really speak. Yeah, uh, they were great. The, the they were basketball great. playing triplets, that was great backstories. Like yeah, the triplets yeah. were a, a Chinese street gang before they became Jaeger pilots. It's yeah. just great. And I'm yeah. like, yeah. instead we focus on like, you know, Raleigh, whose backstory is not the, as interesting, and mm -hmm. Chuck, whose backstory is not as, and I'm like, okay, but like, show me more of the other people, so. And there's, um, and there's Rob Kaczynski, our original Feely, now transferred over really? to Pacific Rim. That's Rob Kaczynski, my dear boy. The original Which one's Rob Feely? Kaczynski? Rob Kaczynski. Is um, he Chuck? Uh, he is the, uh, I think he's the the uh, Jaeger pilot who gets his leg wounded and, uh, forgive me. So um, he's the main, uh, wait, one of the, uh, main the yeah. father. Uh, the father. The son. Australian father? Yeah, he's the son. The son, he's the son, the Australian okay. son. That's okay. right. That's right, yes. Okay. And see, uh, but that's what I'm talking about with character development and The Hobbit. In one two-hour movie, mm -hmm. you have well, all these the thing, like yeah. dynamic backstories mm -hmm. and everything. And then we're two movies into the, I, we're six hours into The Hobbit. It's it's all about. I think what Pacific Rim does very well is with even characters who don't uh, come to the foreground at any point. They manage to communicate their relationship to each other and what their personality is through very through just design and through the way the actors. So and like, I don't have dialogue. to hear the Russians speak to know what their relationship to each other is. It's the way that they stand, the way that they walk, the things they wear, and the way that they interact with each other. And I've already I already know that. And you don't get that as much from the door. No. So I, they do, like, I, I'm yeah. not crazy about every single one of their designs, but they do attempt to distinguish them from each other with the designs, but there's just no... Only it's not visually. so much that I get them mixed... I, it's not that I think they look the same, I just... There's they not much the point in telling them apart. So I, I, I never really felt the mm. need to learn who was Ori and who was Dory and who was Nori. I was just like, Fair starfish enough. dwarf, right? The one with the starfish head, like... Yeah. Just like in, in Fellowship, like, you had four hobbits in the Fellowship, but... You like they all were unique. Mm -hmm. Like you instantly got. Oh, he's the fat Quite. one. The friend, the fat you man. Know, he's a by the time you're halfway through the two towers, you definitely know the difference between Mary and Pippin's personalities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not, not as clear in Fellowship. Yeah, but when you're in two towers, you start to really, really. Tell and we're we're at the end of Desolation, and I still still like yeah. all the doors are interchangeable except for the one that got stabbed. Uh, the one that got shot. Shot? <laughs> shot, yeah. Yeah, shot in the leg. Morgul, they not should not, blade, Morgul. They should not have done that with the Morgul arrow. <laughs> I'm like, that was a terrible idea. Why did you do that? For one, that's really hard to cure, and I don't think that Tariel would have that level of magic. I just don't. I love Tariel. BT they, dubs. All, it should have just been a kind of poison <laughs> that the dwarves didn't know about, and she could have cured it. But, like, using the king's foil, doing the exact same thing again. Foreshadowing. Like, it's the George Lucas foreshadowing That was such syndrome. a huge deal when, when Frodo was stabbed. <laughs> he was, like, so close. To, it was a, such a big deal. And now they're like, oh, this happens regularly. They have arrows with it on it. And I'm <laughs> like, no. I well, agree. They, she, I agree with They you needed a reason for Boffer to go find a pig. Like, Boffer's all about ham and pig. <laughs> but, and but they could have fed any kind of... They could have been like, oh, the cure is this magical mushroom that we feed to the pigs. <laughs> Bam! But it was... <laughs> Hire me, Peter Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well Hire. done, guys. Now, well, in closing, <laughs> let's just say that 
The Desolation of Smaug has continued to polarize the fan base more than any other Peter Jackson film. But I'm going to see it again. Which was a prediction that I made when I wrote my review, my early review. And I'm, I'm glad to see that everybody's with us on the website. We're talking. We have the beautiful message boards. Come and join us in Barliament's chat. You guys should really come and visit us at the main page of theonering.net anytime. And you'll see some really active debates going on in our chat rooms and our message boards as well as on our Facebook timeline. So we have a lot going on. Please come back and visit us more often. All right. Thanks for watching Torn There's Tuesday. That. Send in the message out. And uh, follow him <laughs> at QuickBeam2000. Follow her at Ginger Hazing. On and Twitter. That's the on Twitter. Twitter following. And I'm, yeah. I'm Justin's big idea. And, uh, and we're all part of the One Ring net. <laughs> everywhere. In everywhere. Everywhere. All right. We'll see you next week. Bye. Guys, you're the best. Thanks for joining us. Well done. Hooray. Woo. Hooray. Yeah, great show. Thanks. Really great show. Yeah, that was fun. There's, there's a lot to love, and there's a lot to be pissed off about.